Welcome to the film analysis. Today with The Equalizer Part 3, the final chapter by Antoine Fuqua. A bad film not only by film criticism standards but also by ethical standards. The point is not to moralize falsely, it is perfectly legitimate to enjoy scenes of violence on screen if the film's attitude is ethical, which is unfortunately not the case here. It is a perfidious, a sadistic film. Denzel Washington once again plays Robert McCall, who has a matter to settle between some Sicilians who don't mean well by him and are viciously punished for it. But he also suffers injuries and it almost seems as if he will die at the beginning of the film. But he is able to save himself, he gets into the hands of a doctor who takes care of his injuries. In a coastal town in Italy he comes to rest and slowly regenerates. At first he still walks with a cane through this contemplative village with its quirky but lovable inhabitants. But it soon becomes clear that this idol is deceptive. For the Camorra is up to mischief and terrorizes the population. And now it is a question of time until McCall has enough strength again to confront these villains. The film establishes a touristy exotic view of this coastal town and it remains true to the view, this view until the very end. The film never questions to what extent this exoticism makes sense. And the simplicity worshipped here naturally follows a logic of the glorification of the simple life that we cannot find very credible. The film's taciturnity is also striking. Even if there is talk now and then, it is at most banalities about the way Robert McCall drinks his tea or questions of meaning are murmured such as do you believe in miracles? It's not about moralizing when we talk about this film. Of course we go to the cinema to see scenes in which people shoot at each other in a virtuoso way. But it must be virtuoso. And the question arises in what context do they do it? How is all this staged aesthetically? Aesthetics has an intrinsic value, hence why violence can also be enjoyed as art. But you must carry an aesthetic like John Wick for example or old Bruce Lee films. But Equalizer Part 3 as its predecessors does not offer such an aesthetic. The film doesn't offer even one unique scene. Director Antoine Fuqua still hasn't developed his own style. As Equalizer 3 has no signature of its own, it quotes what you have in mind anyway when you think of a brutal film. Sometimes the camera plays a bit with the perspectives but nothing really comes out of it. The first entry of the series featured slow motion imitating the Zack Snyder style a bit but that doesn't really work either. And so with the third part we are dealing with a film that aesthetically cannot conjure, conjure up anything remarkable on the screen. The film covers up its shortcomings by depicting enormous brutality, drastic images, crushing heads, stabbings and so on. And we are supposed to recognize some kind of aesthetic in these entrails, in all this blood, but it simply remains slaughter of people. And this is depicted for reasons that are not to be found in the film's stance, but solely for effect. 
But let's think back to the first part for a moment and the strange dialogue starting in a diner. McCall is sitting there drinking his tea in his strange way and there is a young woman forced to work as a prostitute but who wants to become a singer. And she mentions that very briefly and McCall says you must be good as a singer. And she asks, how do you know? And he answers, intuition. A silly epistemology, as we witness repeatedly in relation to the other characters that McCall encounters in the series. McCall doesn't try to learn through observation, facts and evidence, but merely by intuition. To be able to judge someone's vocal ability by intuition without ever having heard someone sing. Now let's look at the third part and stay with this intuition and with the morality the film wants to establish. McCall is saved by the doctor and this doctor takes care of McCall's injuries a good deed. He acts according to a doctor's duty. He must help the injured man. But the other villagers are not doing anything good or bad. They are just there. McCall sees them and recognizes good people in them. They don't even have to demonstrate this through actions, just as the singer doesn't have to demonstrate that she is a good singer, he just feels that she is a good singer and they are good people. Quite anti-intellectual. Here one look is enough and you already know who is good or bad. And the members of the Mafia are staged accordingly they are the bad guys, they appear like caricatures and we as the audience are supposed to look them in the face and realize just like McCall they are the bad guys even before they acted. And in fact they act badly later enabling us to say yes these are the people who do evil. McCall's taciturnity is supposed to radiate wisdom, but all we hear is emptiness wafting in his head. When he opens his mouth, all that comes out is nonsense. In the first part he talks about body, mind and soul, which you can also read on any tear of calendar. And now in the third part he asks whether there are miracles, he asks questions about religion and God, or he expresses maxims as I like order. McCall is a subject of maximum uncertainty. Individual fads like the thoughtful drinking of tea with several serviettes solve this insecurity, but these habits do not mature into a ritual because they are groundless. This uncertainty is further minimized by reducing the space for action. The Sicilian coastal town seems to be cut off from modernity. International and ultra-modern only the Camorra operates while the other inhabitants seem like survivors of the 19th century. The film is not looking for originality, just as Pasolini with his documentaries wanted to find this originality in Italy, which had not yet been overformed by consumerism and capitalism, but this film simply asserts this originality is still there. It shows us the faces, it shows the smiling, wise-looking old people, and we are supposed to experience, yes, this is the real Italy. Here the people are still completely themselves. Here people are still honest, upright and good and only the evil Camorra stands in the way. The dominant stone grey colouring in the film matches this. Like rock the people are unchanged, solid and immovable.
and where nothing can change, there is really no need to think a reactionary film. Communication works non-verbally through deep looks or through a smile. Equalizer Part 3 features quite some Martin Heidegger. Why? Well, Heidegger also made the non-verbal very strong. He also vouched for escaping these intellectual discourses, these many words. There is a little Heidegger text further elaborating the issue, why do I stay in the province? Heidegger describes a mountain landscape, not with the touristic view, however, but with the truthful as he believes working here. He repeatedly tells of a peasant woman sending him her greetings and this greetings is in principle more important to him than any article appearing in a newspaper about his alleged philosophy. Heidegger concluded with the following. Recently I got a second invitation to teach at the University of Berlin. On that occasion I left Freiburg and withdrew to the cabin. I listened to what the mountains and the forest and the farmlands were saying. And I went to see an old friend of mine, a 75-year-old farmer. He had read about the call to Berlin in the newspapers. What would he say? Slowly he fixed the sure gaze of his clear eyes on mine and keeping his mouth tightly shut, he thoughtfully put his faithful hand on my shoulder. Ever so slightly he shook his head. That means absolutely no. End of quote. Admittedly, a pleasant read and certainly intuition is not fundamentally bad, but in fact it is often the contra-intuition that helps us. It is only by reflecting on the facts, thoroughly weighing them up, discussing various facets that we reach a correct conclusion. For example, to evaluate moral or political issues, an intuitu intuitive impression is not enough. It is not enough to say, that's a good guy. Rather, the argument begins where the counterintuitive starts, but that is exactly what Equalizer Part 3 cuts off completely. We are supposed to act only from intuition. The farmer acts towards Heidegger as McCall acts towards the population and the population acts towards him. We are supposed to see quite clearly what is to be done, simply out of oneself, without thinking, without reasoning. You just know because you are on the side of truth and on the side of good. In the first film we already have someone who doesn't really want to fight anymore, but then must do it again on the grounds of creating peace. He must fight one last time, but then there is peace, then evil is defeated. And of course this is a fallacy. Hence, two more films followed. Again, peace must be established, but uh, suppose peace, because what kind of peace is that? Everything was always supposed to be in order, only disturbed from the outside by this intruder here in the form of the Mafia. The good people are staged here as one that must be protected from the adversaries from the Camorra. And the film drastically shows how the Camorra acts. How was it possible for the Camorra to establish itself? How could it also brutalize itself in this way? This brutalization did not come out of no nowhere. The Mafia is a structure that was able to develop and solidify due to certain social circumstances. This tyranny because it does not accept state law is programmed 
for disinhibition and therefore continues to brutalize itself. This is where a discourse begins on how one can contain the bad guys without lapsing into such biblical evil and good thinking. In the third part, we must look at evil without context. McCall returns once more and doesn't realize that there can't be a final chapter because evil doesn't disappear. In truth, there is no such final battle. Evil's depiction is of interest. Yes, we see the mafia boss hitting a father who is already down or threatening to torture the little daughter. That is indeed very evil, but are the Camorra members the film shows inherently evil? In fact, they do evil, but in doing so they are aware of their immoral behavior. Evil is also inherent in human beings. Immanuel Kant would agree. But the decision to be evil or to do evil lies in the freedom of the human being. But it is always possible to become a better person and no one is completely lost. The Milgram experiment has shown how much evil is also inherent in us. It illustrates how quickly we can realize the evil we do within ourselves. In the case of the Camorra henchmen, we are not dealing with the radically different, which must be eradicated so that we can be the pure, the good. Even though Equalizer 3 attempts to evoke a battle of the good guys against Satan. In its Italian setting, the film heavily features biblical motives quoted implicitly and explicitly. Equalizer 3 tries to create a final battle in which good is supposed to triumph forever. But as I said, the final chapter cannot exist. Even the cruelly acting Kamara boss is a human being, which is why we should look at the film's finale differently. And perhaps many did just that. And perhaps it was intuition that first opened this interpretation. Because intuitively, we feel sorry for people who are tormented. And for good reason too. The final finale boils down to the equalizer cracking down. But then there's that one last one, the head of the Camorra. He must be taken down. But the point here is not to have a quick fix, but for the film to exhibit how ostentatiously you should torture an evil person. And that's exactly what the equalizer does. He gets to his head honcho, this head honcho, uh, fight ensues, and suddenly this boss is badly wounded and drugged. And we see this mafia boss dragging himself on all fours through the narrow streets of the village, somehow trying to gasp for are finally dying miserably. But there are parallel montages to a Maria procession also taking place in this village. The good people are shown praying to Mary organizing this procession. They pretend to be the good ones. Here is the last bad guy dying on this road like an animal. But of course, precisely because everything is already so religiously charged, one thinks of how Jesus was forced to carry his own cross to execution, how he dragged himself through the narrow streets. Exactly these images suddenly glimmer. And even if they don't, we see here how a human being is tortured, how certainly broke bad and would also do so if he were not prevented from doing so. But suddenly our attitude to it differs. Unless we are wholly unethical like the film, take an ethical stance to what we see, suddenly we see the perfidy in the message of The Equalizer 3 and recoil from what we see. It is a very heinous scene 
that is being played out. We wait for a human being to die. We, uh, as we experienced in the first part, but here implemented much more drastically. Remarkably, even a film as bad as Equalizer 3 succeeds in producing a bit of surplus. In the end, the depiction becomes smarter than its creators, even turns against them and makes us feel pity for the supposed bad guy. If we don't feel this pity, we should ask ourselves to what extent we are sadistic. Are we so sure that we are not the bad guys when we enjoy an individual being tortured? Of course, we can't ignore the aesthetics of this work when asking to what extent it is unethical. And in doing so, we must talk about the position of the camera, literally how someone holds the camera. Equalizer 3 keeps a steady view. Those lying on the ground are once again explicitly shown in their suffering. Interestingly, this is exactly the methodology of these mafia bosses, how they deal with the population they terrorize. They also once again kick those who are down, but the camera doesn't really do anything else with the Camorra members. It also kicks them again, it also looks at them again from above. And this is where the ideology of this film becomes particularly clear when the film stages the good people not only as the praying people, but also as the people who rejoice when their own football team wins. The good people cheer and McCall too suddenly rejoices. The good people supposedly pristine. They are staged here in all their purity, almost carrying fascistic elements. McCall says, through these people, I begin to understand what true peace is. But it is, of course, a false piece. There is this idea of the good deed in McCall. As revealed at the very end, the whole motive for him to enter Italy was to go after someone having hacked a pension fund and that hack ensured that someone didn't get their $300,000 pension because a criminal had obtained that money. And McCall wanted to see justice done. Out of duty, he acted to remedy that injustice. It is an act of doing something good, a moral act indeed, even if no political or social design can be derived from it. But that one good deed is obscured by all the cruelty, by all the unethical behavior that McCall and the film itself engaged engage in, so that we watch, but don't see. It would be nice if you would like to support the film analysis financially. You can do so via my bank account or PayPal. Also, you can find me on Patreon. Thank you very much.